the mental health part is seems to be such a such a huge part of their their time spent um, in in with coaching, like the things that kids are struggle, the things they are struggling to deal with on a daily basis, right or wrong. Some of which I think that we dealt with and other generations dealt with. You just dealt with them, not having the tools to deal with some of these situations. I mean, the, the there there are kids that are are bringing. Um, and this, these are like, like doctor, almost like, I guess like doctor prescribed, right? Like, um, on one team, uh, the girl had a emotional support dog. So that emotional support dog went with her everywhere. So that emotional support dog went to practice on the bus for games. It went, it went everywhere and you're going to laugh at this. And I think we do it because we're, we're old school in some, in those respects, I was talking to that same coach and she had another girl this year who she was trying to get and she had an emotional support cat. So I said, <laughs> what happens when you go on the bus with the emotional support cat and the emotional support dog? Like, how does that work? <laughs> and she just said, I, I never, I never even thought of that. I said, well, it's a reality. And I want to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But the the whole and and I get it, but I think it goes back to what you were just saying about like teaching the ki- teaching kids responsibility, teaching kids accountability. We've lacked that as a society. I feel like at least in the states, and I think that's where it begins to show itself. Like if you've never had to deal with some, any kind of adversity or issues, when it comes up, you just don't have the tools to deal with it. So, uh, you know, the, the inability to take any kind of criti- criticism. So do you let someone just keep going, uh, basically interfering with your practices and everything? You, you just let it happen because you're afraid to say, well, no, that's not that's not the role of responsibility. You know, it just what, what would you, you know, if you if you can't say, no, this is this is the time to do this and this is the time to do that. And I, I just thought uh, it would end right there and the next day, you know, would be on the bench and all hunky-dory, but this girl quit the team because she'd been uh, corrected. So, you know, I just shake your head and say, holy geez. Right, You and you you worry because, because you care, again, talk like, um, talked about well, I talked about that quite a bit about right. You're you're trying to you're trying to create an individual and teach them life skills and those types of things. So like, what what life skill will that girl ever have? The life skill she has when there's adversity, just quit. And like, what's that going to translate into? Is that going to translate into a job? Is that going to translate to an issue in a marriage? Is that going to translate to issue? Right, trying to raise kids if you have kids like the, the life skills part of this is so much more important again because you will get your outcomes based on what you create as a program in your culture that you create you'll get your wins and losses you'll get your successes and successes and wins and losses aren't necessarily meaning you win a championship right there are all types of wins and losses and successes amongst the team like we had like this year this year the last year i retired we were picked to finish last right we were picked to finish last we beat the team that was picked to finish first then we beat the team in overtime that did finish first lost in the finals and obviously you want to win but other than the fact that we get got a second place instead of first place trophy we won everything that year oh yeah <clears throat> for sure right and like but getting kids to understand that like that's the unfortunate thing, right that that girl you're talking about will likely never get to that point because all she knows is how to quit when things get difficult as opposed to how to push through when things get difficult so that's that's sad 
Yeah, that's that's one of the huge things that sports teaches, eh? You lose, and how do you you know how do you bounce back, or you're playing badly? How do you change that around, you know, so it doesn't spiral? Right. Plus, you're gonna you're gonna have to be again when you're right. There's a saying that uh, you know what flows uphill, and you got to be ready for that as a head coach. And again, I think that's potentially some of these things with some of the younger coaches. They're not ready for that, and because they're not ready for that, uh, they make excuses. Like when I when I used to recruit the guys, I used to say to them, "Have you ever had a coach bring you in? You know, you, maybe you weren't playing as much as you wanted to." And they said, and said, uh, you know what? You just got to keep grinding. You got to work harder. And most of them, actually, every everyone has always said yes that they had a coach that told them that. So I told them, I said, if you come play for me, and I ever tell you that, you have my permission to punch me in the face. Because that is the biggest cop out there is. There's a reason, like. There's there's a reason there's always something you can do and something you can work on and have a purpose and it may not get you in the lineup, but you will know why you're not playing and you will know what you got to work on. And I just think that's something that, again, a lot of young guys that I say in the coaching world, they avoid that again because it's confrontation and kind of speaking to your point, like if that girl there ever becomes a coach she's probably not going to be very good at um, explaining why you're playing, why you're not playing, because any kind of a confrontation becomes uncomfortable. So it's easier because that's what she's done her whole life, right? Is avoid uncomfortable situations instead of actually dealing with them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really important. Yeah. And, uh, and also that, you're tying the hands of the coaching staff if you're not allowed to, you know, if you have to say, oh, everything's great all the time, even if it isn't. I mean, how that's dishonest. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like, um, like here, my, my wife's a big uh, baseball fan, Boston Red Sox. <clears throat> We're doing terribly this year. And I said, you, I said the, your manager says the same thing every time he's interviewed. Yeah, we got to get better. We got to put things together. Uh, we got a good group. And I said to her, I said, I guarantee you that there's stuff going on in that locker room. I told her that two months ago. And then they had these guys that do like, you know, the insider stuff, right? The, the yeah. sports guys that are always around the team and that. And this guy got on and for 10 minutes, all they talked about were the issues in the locker room. And I said, you could see it. But it, you got a manager who's not willing to say, we have to be better and here's how we're going to be better All right it's one thing to say we got to be better right that's again that's sort of the the punch in the face mode right like that's easy that's a cop out how are we going to be better right and and verbalize that and be okay verbalizing that be okay being uncomfortable i i don't know how you put today's 30 some year old who's grown up their whole life not in that type of situation to begin to to be the person who understands that it's okay to be uncomfortable because that's how I'm going to get better and I got to deal with that as a coach just like you got to deal with that as a player. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's a challenge. Yeah, I, I got I to ask Wally, don't don't put that stuff on the internet because, you know, it's kind of a... Okay, I won't that about my post this show, but... I may edit bits and pieces out. Yeah. Listen, I, Peter, I, uh, I think it's just a case about honest conversations. There's a lady called Susan Scott. You might write this down. She's got a business called Fierce Conversations. And uh, when I do coaching clinics, I I say you, you just have to be honest with one another. And one of the things I I got out of one of her presentations was this question. And I asked the coaches, all of them who are male, there might be two or three female. 
ask your wife this question. And you could ask your players this question. Ask your wife, what do you know? What is it that we don't want to talk about? That's the essence of avoiding a cop out. So whether it's in relationships, marriages, work, communication between the hierarchy and organizations, you have to have honest conversations and sometimes they gotta be fierce. Now, Peter, when I, uh, when you were talking about, to me, it was amazing how you had that eight year old kid. Every coach can do that. They can make the kid responsible to phone. That means the kid and the parent are communicating and there's nobody making excuses. The kid is going to talk to you. That's primary. And um, one of the things I'm going to share with you, Peter, on the behavioral side of hockey, uh, when, when I coached, I found there were three things or two or three things that were cardinal things that were non-negotiable that could not happen. And in hockey, uh, and this is pretty competitive hockey, and I, I write these down because you have to address them consistently, not just with any um, an average player, but even with your best players because they may be the ones violating the cardinal. Number one was a shift length. It disrupts the rotation. They get exhausted. It's an ego thing by staying out long. And it's one thing to want to do it for your team. But from a coaching point of view, it's non-negotiable. Shift lengths. And last week, Gardner McDougall reduced the shift lengths, I believe, from a minute and 10 seconds to 50 seconds with the Memorial Cup winning team. He was aware going in, their shifts were on the long side, and though he made that a goal for them that they agreed upon. Yeah, you can't have any pace or tempo, right, with that. Now, the second thing, and this is beginning with kids, is you make a headband pass when somebody is available. And the third thing is reaction penalty. That means somebody did something to you, a clean check. You got upset and reacted. You can control your emotions. That's what the sports to teach you. And coaches don't address that consistently. They, they, they might address it with an average player, but they don't dare address it with a good player. They stay out too long. They don't hit man in the puck. They don't know when to share it. And there's all kinds of players that take bad penalties. So the number one thing here is how you communicate that. And you communicate it by discussing your Cardinals with the players. And they must discuss the Cardinals with the parents, not you. They have to discuss it. And when it happens, the sequence that I've implemented, the first time it happens results in a conversation. Do you remember what we talked about? Why are we doing it? To learn that this is important. It matters for the team. Second time it happens, you miss a shift. And they're going to have to explain their parents. A behavioral, you're teaching behaviors, you're teaching team play, you're teaching respect for the officials, respect for your teammates, respect for the opponents, everything, life skills. And they are the ones that have to explain it to the parent, not you. And it's something you don't sort of put up front to them. You could before when the parent comes at you with a question. Why did my kids sit? We said, you should ask them. 
So on the flip side, if you're coaching and double shifting your best players and letting them stay out too long, you're failing. You're not you're not recognizing the physiology and the psychology of building a team. So to me, that's part of the art of coaching is being able to. So part of coaching education is to teach them, provide them with the tools. And I wrote down here, um, Peter, when you, you mentioned you had the kid phone, I wrote down, writing some questions down related to the mission statement exercise. And the question th that I wrote down was, um, what do we need to do better to win? What do we need to do better? What are we not doing as well as we should? It might be wrong. So when I do high, uh, high performance evaluations of coaches, for the province that I live in. I've done them for many years and I, I do a different one. Most of them are just a checklist and everybody gets ticked off and passed. Well, I like to educate them as I evaluate them and I mandate them behaviorally to have a routine between periods in terms of how they communicate with their staff and their players. At the end of a period, Peter, what do you do with your team? Period's over, first period, good, bad, what? What happens with you? Your team might go in the room for a flood. What's your sequencing before you get into the room to talk to them? At the, well, at the college level? Whatever level. Right. Well, I mean, it, it depends. Like, like, fortunately, at the college level, you, you've got staff. Sometimes you don't have much going on. But, like, at the youth level, it would be let the kids get in the room and settle down for a minute, right? Take their helmets off and that and just grab their water bottles. Um, if, you know, if they have that, if they have that ability. I mean, lots of times, honestly, like with us in the States at the youth level, you just play. So at the end of a period, you've got about a minute where the kids just go on the ice in front of the bench. And as a coach, and we've thought, we would have talked about this prior to the game, is I, use, I always try to use with kids like a three to one ratio, three good things that we're doing versus one thing that uh, we really got to improve on. And we would share that. And that happens, honestly. Um, in about a minute to two minutes, because in youth hockey in the States, there's no floods in between. So different when you get now advanced to the to the college level where we still focus on that. I still have that three to one on the, the positive things we're doing well versus the one thing that um, we need. And then I give my assistant coach like like I would I would. Uh, he was really, really good X's and O's wise, and he really enjoyed that. So if there was something we need to clear up or shore up on the like that, I would let him do that. I would talk more about the holistic things, about what we're doing well, uh, attitudes, um, shift lengths, whatever it may be in that game, because it will vary from game to game what you need to do in period to period, what, what you're doing well, what you need to improve on. And then I would always ask the team if they had anything that they would chime in because in college you get about 15 minutes, but at the youth level, it, it happens super quick. I'm not, I'm not sure if you would, here's what I tell you I, you have to do. If I'm evaluating you in the bench, I'm asking you to do this to experiment with it as a part of the evaluation. The first thing you do on the bench usually is talk to your assistants. Now we can, to me, it doesn't matter what level. Uh, when they have whole ice hockey and there's a score clock, it doesn't matter. And the very first thing is, you might have had a bad period. You're negative. You ask your assistants. You have to ask them and listen. What do we do well? I don't care about what we did wrong. 
Look for some positives so you can get your mindset. Then you can talk about what do we need to do better? And if you're at a high level, you might go by offensively, by zone, defensively. Uh, and you talk, you have that five or ten minutes outside the room. And you're filtering all their feedback. But now the difference is, you don't go in the room and tell them. You go in the room and ask the kids the same question. What do we do well? And you wait. And if they didn't think of anything, you bring up a few things. Now, what do we need to do better? And I did this at one HP class. It was an under 18 team, uh, HP team. And I noticed on the bench, they had no D zone structure. They were hanging on the, up high on the boards when the other team had the puck in their end. They weren't collapsing. There just was no awareness of D zone play. And I brought it up with the fellow I was evaluating who was an assistant young guy. And I said, you know, you have no structure here. I'm on the bench for the first period. I said, look, look at their D zone. They, he's been waiting on the boards. They've got the puck in the corner. And he said to me, well, they should have learned that by now. And I said, no, you have to teach them that if they haven't learned it by now. And I said, if you want to pass, you better take this to heart and do something about it. Like this is high performance coaching. You're going to get a pass saying something like, well, we got to work harder. That's not good enough. So anyway, in between periods, what do we have to do better? There was silence. The captain puts up his hand. We have to play better in our zone. We're god awful. And I looked over at the assistant coach. And I said, did you hear that? Yeah, I, I called him out right there, the coach in front of the kids. I told him, I talked about it on the bench. You got it. The kids know. If you don't ask them and you're always telling them, now you're the head coach. You gathered the information from your staff and your players before you've shared your wisdom. You've allowed them to express them, their thoughts. You know them now. You know who your leaders are, who's aware of what and what you have to say. So that's that's part of this, what I call process of the new way of coaching, going from yelling to telling to asking. That's the new way of coaching is the Socrates method of coaching. And uh, I believe young kids today are ready for it. They, they want to be asked. They want to express themselves. We have to learn to listen better. And that's just a leadership thing. And it's authentic communication. I think it's really, really important. But anyway, that I just thought I'd share it with you. I'm 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 looking at ways on this mission statement exercise and saying, what are the life skills we have to have to win a championship? What are the personal life skills that we have to have to win a championship? And I wonder what the players would say. And I wonder if they come up with trust, respect, work ethic, development, and those kind of things. So if it comes from them, you'll get the buy-in sooner than later, I, I believe. So anyway, we've gone hour and 41. Uh, Tom, thanks for all your feedback. I'm going to send out, Peter, you will particularly enjoy. Uh, if you send me an email, Peter, so I can get your address. Mine, okay, how, how would I send that to you? Okay, Wally Kozak 
W-A-L-L-Y-K-O-Z-A-K at gmail.com. Then I'll add your name to the Sharks email list. And uh, hopefully you participate in this mission statement exercise. And now you'll have an opportunity to do to more formal education things with your circle of influence, your associations, your leadership groups, your uh, boards. And the key is educating coaches and getting them to educate parents and players by setting the example. So looking forward to it down the road here. So yeah, I, I appreciate you guys letting me part, be part of this. Thank you so much. Okay. Tommy, are you skating today? No, I'm playing in uh, a Scotty Laird Memorial Tournament this afternoon. Where's so it at? I, yeah, he was, he was a good hockey player and stuff. And then when he was about 18 or 20 or something, he helped his uncle tear down some houses. Yeah. And uh, there was asbestos. So I guess it just sat kind of in his lungs for 30, 40 years. And then boom, it worked really fast and he died two years ago. Mm. So it, the money goes to uh, some association for whatever the cancer is called that it causes. Yeah. So I'm going to play the saft. Well, have fun. Peter, yeah. good meeting you. I'm glad you came on, and uh, hopefully you'll join us on a regular basis. And, yeah, Tom, uh, I appreciate Peter. your thoughts and, and uh, your expertise. Really, it's, it's Oh, I appreciate fun. yours. Like, you do it naturally. You don't need the exercise, but you got to affect a larger audience of adults that can do what you do. It's one thing to leave your team with a staff that you know is going to do things the right way. But now we want to get all coaches leading their teams the right way. Yeah, I agree with that. It's yeah. great. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. So long. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.